It's 101 degrees outside, and I am standing in an abandoned lumber yard in Preston, Idaho, when the call comes in. The cow is late for work. My mind seizes. My world stands on the precipice of falling apart because a cow is late for work. A, a quick show of hands. Who here's seen Napoleon Dynamite? Hey, awesome, thank you. All right, for the rest of you, the rest of this talk is going to be really weird. <laughs> the, uh, the first AD continues. This is like, hey man, we're on scene 29, exterior Napoleon's house. Napoleon is waiting for the bus while Lyle is with the cow, but the thing is, we don't have a cow. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's a bad deal. It was not a question of if a cow was going to magically appear. It was a question of how a cow was going to magically appear. But fortunately, I was uniquely equipped to deal with this situation. You see, I grew up in a small town, scenic Edgemont, South Dakota, which, yes, you've been there, <laughs> <laughs> which has a population almost exactly the size of the capacity of this theater. And every phone number in my hometown begins relatively the same way. 605-662-7, bop, bop, bop. So we can presumably communicate our phone number to others by giving them three digits. We don't. That's some redneck Mabel at the switchboard crap, but we could. <laughs> and Preston, Idaho was much the same way, so I pick up the phone, I dial 208-652-6, beep, boop, boop, and I wait, and it rings. And a voice picks up on the other side, hello? I just start babbling, yes, hi, how, I'm with the, the movie? Oh, the movie, how can we help you? Yes, good. So here's the thing. Uh, we need a cow for a scene, but the cow is late for work, so I've got to find one. But it can't just be any cow. It's got to be a cow that's used to being around people, because there's going to be actors and a camera and a gun. And he interrupts me. He says, listen here. I just so happen to have an FFA grand champion show cow sitting behind the barn right now. <laughs> her name is Madeline, and we can have her loaded up into you in the next 20 minutes. And I'm like, Fantastic. Let me tell you where we are. He says, no, no. We know exactly where you are. <laughs> and 20 minutes, Madeline showed up, and uh, we filmed this. Hey, Lyle. Yeah, so that's actually based on a true story that happened to the director's brother who was waiting for the bus and Lyle did the thing. And, uh, and many a small child found the path to vegetarianism that day. <laughs> so in making movies, you have to love the questions. You can't rely on a series of answers. It's not like accounting or engineering where you have a number of formulas that can give you a consistent result each and every time. In making movies, there will be strange situations that show up that you've never imagined taking care of. And the way you deal with that is to build a team that can handle those surprises. It's my job as a producer to build that team. And it's my duty to make sure that everyone on that team is smarter than I am, which is not a particularly high bar, but that's the goal. My goal is to build the room and make sure that I am never the smartest person in the room. I want someone who's, who's better than I am at their task. I want someone who can imagine the second-by-second second evolution of the movie in great detail as the director. I want someone who can elevate a character from the page as the actor, or capture the film in only pictures as the cinematographer, or save the day as a cattle rancher. The goal that I have is to build the team and place as many geniuses on the team as I can, and it's my job to manage them. Now, my method for doing this is actually something I learned way before I went to film school at USC. Uh, in my previous career, I was a headhunter in San Francisco, and it was during the dot-com boom. Venture capital firms were hiring me to help them find management teams to take an idea and make it real. But the thing is, I had no idea what I was doing. Not a freaking clue. I had just moved to San Francisco. I was dead broke. I had sold my car for the money to get a U-Haul and throw my motorcycle and a mattress in the back of it. I even lived in that thing for a while. So what I do is when a, a candidate came in, I would just read them job descriptions and let them tell me if, if that was the right fit. And I remember a candidate that I had. His name was Oleg, this Russian guy. He stood about five foot five. 
and he came in and I sat him down and I'm like, okay, um, Oleg, are, are you a, a software engineer? Do you code? And he says, no, net. He says, net. I said, oh, so you're a, a database guy? He says, no. Finance? He says, no, I do none of these things. By the way, my Russian accent is atrocious, but I'm kind of committed to this at this point, <laughs> right? Uh, so I said, okay, um, well, the form thing asks how much money you made last year. And he said, last year I make $250,000. Do you know how much money $250,000 was in the year 2000? Let me tell you. It was $250,000. I don't care what year it is, $250,000 is a lot of money. So I say, Oleg, I hope you don't think I'm being rude, but I gotta ask you, what do you do to make a quarter million dollars a year? Near as I can tell, you have no discernible skills. <laughs> and he thinks about it and he says, I do not have skills, I have talent. He goes on to explain that his talent is to manage geniuses, that is what he does. He says, when a genius comes flying into my office, very frustrated because they have a problem they cannot solve, a question they cannot answer, I cannot provide them the answer. I cannot check their mathematics. These are individuals with multiple advanced degrees in mathematics and computer sciences. I cannot tell them to go back to their cubicle and unplug the problem, plug it back in. <laughs> like an internet router, he said that many of my employees were involved in inventing the internet router. He said, so I learned the trick. He said, when a genius comes into my office, frustrated at what's happening, I sit and I listen. And then I say, oh no, this is a terrible problem. If this problem is unsolvable, which you say it is, and you're a genius, then clearly we will have to close the company. But listen, I have conference call I must go on. It will take one hour. Why don't you take a break? Go for a walk, get a cup of coffee. We will meet back here in one hour and discuss how we must close the company. Have a nice walk. He said it would never take a full hour. Within a half hour, they would blow back into his office, electric, that they had not only solved the problem, but often invented new technologies in the process. He said, that is how you manage genius. You do not give them answers. You give them questions, and you give them space. That's a big idea a really big idea. Oleg would go on to explain that the human mind is a computer, pure and simple. Computers process information the same way we process information. They think like we do because we created them and we don't know another way to think. And a computer has one job. That job is to answer questions. In the beginning, in 1822, those questions were fairly simple. As Charles Babbage revealed his differential engine, it was various forms of the question, what's two plus two? Later, in 1997, IBM would advance those questions and create Deep Blue to answer the question, how do we beat a Russian chess champion? Later, questions would evolve even further. How do we take all the information in human history and make it available to literally billions of people in a way that they can collaborate? And then once we've done so, how, how do we pack it down into a device that's small enough to fit in the front pocket? And once we've done that, how do we stick a camera on it so that people can take pictures of their breakfast? <laughs> the mind is a computer. A computer has one job. That job is to answer questions. When you realize this, you gain ownership of your computer. You gain the ability to direct your questions, and you gain the ability to direct your life. Intend the question, benefit from the answer. The mind is a computer, a computer has one job, that job is to answer questions. And when you realize this, you gain insights into people around you. You can see who's asking questions that result in positive answers or negative answers, pure and simple. You can see the people that come up to you on Monday and they can't wait to tell you about the thing that they did that weekend. People are asking the question, what's the great music I'm listening to? Or what's my favorite podcast? They can't wait to share it with you because positive questions result in positive answers. But there is a flip side. It is a dangerous one. Ask your mind the question, what's wrong with my life? And it will tell you. Ask it, what's wrong with my relationship? Why am I not happy? Why am I not more successful? 
ask these questions and your mind will do its job. It will provide a long and comprehensive answer. The mind is a computer. A computer has one job. That job is to answer questions. I didn't realize it at the time, but Oleg had presented me not only with a simple idea, he also presented me with perhaps the most important word in my vocabulary, maybe the most important word in my life. It is a word that has given me my successes for what they are. It is a word that's helped me pick myself up and dust myself off after many, many, many failures. And a word that's given me every adventure I never expected to have. And in fact, it is a word that's at the center of your life, too. You use it every day, though you may not intend to. The word is simple. The word is how. How. When you begin a question with the word how, you change everything. Can we questions result in answers that are binary? Can we do this? Yes, we can. No, we can't. But how questions, how do we do this? Well, that expands the answers in a million directions. Now you've invited brainstorming and collaboration and innovation. I'll give you an example. Can I fly? Regrettably, no, I cannot. But how can I fly? Oh, well, I can get on an airplane, right? I can be one of those insane people that puts on the flying squirrel suit and jumps off of a cliff. That counts. I can build a large slingshot, or, or I can do what Larry Walters did. Larry was a truck driver in Los Angeles, and he always wanted to fly. So he asked his mind a how question. How can I fly? And his mind replied. So Larry took 100 helium-filled weather balloons and tied them to a lawn chair. He grabbed a six-pack and a BB gun, and he soon found himself floating 15,000 feet above Los Angeles and directly into the incoming pathway of Los Angeles International Airport. <laughs> Larry asked his mind a question, how can I fly? And what Larry got was very, very arrested, is what Larry got. Larry got arrested. <laughs> but he achieved his goal. Question asked, question answered, goal achieved. Because the mind is a computer, a computer has one job, that job is to answer questions. In making movies, I first receive a screenplay and I read it like a piece of literature. I want to know the tone, I want to know the characters and the world and the story. And if I decide to come onto it as a producer, which is a big decision because making a movie takes about two years of my life. If I decide to come onto it, that script changes, now it's a blueprint. I'm looking for how many locations, how many speaking parts to determine how many actors, how many times we're shooting exterior nights so I know our lighting package. That gives me a budget and a schedule. And then the screenplay evolves again. It becomes a to-do list of things I have to figure out how to find. And sometimes that to-do list can be very strange. Like, how do I put 10,000 chickens in a barn so we can shoot one shot of the movie? Or how do I find a bodybuilder in an American flag bikini. This, by the way, is Carmen. She is a wonderful human being who could very literally throw Aaron Rule, who plays Kip, over a mountain. <laughs> or every once in a while, I run into the problem that I, I simply don't know how to solve. And in the case of Napoleon, it was finding a llama in the middle of Idaho. I was calling all over Idaho and all over Utah. I was even tracking the movement of circuses to see if we could borrow their llama but no go, and I had to do the thing that I, I hate doing. I had to go up to the director and say, Jared, listen, man, I've been working on this, but I can't find this llama. And he said, oh, man, that's a bummer. He said, well, I guess, I guess we could use my family's llama. <laughs> Her name is Dolly, Dolly Llama. <laughs> and then we cast Tina. The mind is a computer. A computer has one job. That job is to answer questions. The most important questions that you can ask your mind begin with the word, how. When you realize this, you're able to start structuring your goals. You're able to intentionally set the direction of your life. And you're able to help other people that are facing a situation you never imagined. So it was a few years ago now, and I was having coffee with a teacher from Robbinsdale Elementary School. She was a second grade teacher. And it was the day before Christmas break, and I did the thing that you do. I asked, so are, are, are your kids excited for break? And she paused, which I thought was weird. She said, 
half of her 25 kid class was nervous about break because they depended on the school lunch programs for consistent meals. And the 12 days of Christmas break were, were causing them great concern and anxiety. I learned from her that schools do such an amazing job at providing meals to students. I learned about the free and reduced lunch program, the breakfast program, the backpack program, which supplies meals to carry a kid over the weekend. I learned about summer programs that I had no idea existed. But these 12 days of Christmas break were the only time in the year that the school shut down completely. The kids were scared. I thought to myself, that's, that's not OK. 12 families with elementary school students, 12 days of Christmas. What, what, what can I possibly get for elementary school students that they would enjoy each and every day? Pizza. I once made a movie called The 12 Dogs of Christmas, which is obviously a play on the 12 days of Christmas. So in that moment, created the 12 days of pizza. Super excited. We're going to sponsor 12 families for 12 days, 144 meals. And I just needed to figure out how to do it. But I made a mistake. I called two local pizza places and I said, here's the plan. Can we do it? And they both said no. The first said that they had already expended their budget for community service that year. The second said it was a great idea, but there wasn't enough time to prepare for it, which was a hard point to argue. We were 20 hours away from school letting out. But then I was introduced to a guy named Jack Linus. Jack works at Black Hills Community Bank. And I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, I think I might know how to help. We hung up, and literally five minutes later, he called back to say, Pizza Ranch is in. So year one, 12 families, 12 days, 144 meals provided. Year two, we were able to spread it from Rapid City up to Spearfish and Sturgis and Lead Deadwood so we could sponsor 48 families with 600 <laughs> meals provided. Uh, that year, we were tracking the redemption of pizza party coupons. And th the rate was about 90%, which meant that we had found a problem and not only identified it, but possibly addressed it. So in year three, I wanted to double the number of families. I wanted to expand from 48 families to 100 families. And that's where I wanted to provide 1,200 meals. But we did not hit the goal. We did not provide 1,200 meals. The program provided 12,000. <laughs> Another good day. <laughs> and the reason for that was that other communities were facing the same issue. And so the concept arced through Pizza Ranch all over the nation. And they realized they had a problem and didn't have to ask if they could solve it because they knew how. Mind is a computer. A computer has one job. That job is to answer questions. So, so what, what do you do? How do we apply this to your life? How do, you, how do you find the things that are holding you down and flip them from what's going wrong to what's going right? How, if you're in a, a company, how do you use how to direct the company? How do you use how to manage your teams and set them all on the right path? When you do it, you not only give them direction, but you also transition them from the people who work for you into the people who work with you because they have the same goal. I must say this, I recently applied this idea because I, perhaps like you, I was in a super stressful situation totally freaking out, on the verge of a panic attack, because my, my mind was receiving a question from me, which is, what's going wrong right now? What are the worst things that could happen? Why am I lost? I had to take a break. I had to flip it. How can I deal with what's going on right now? How, how can I work to have the best possible things go on? How, how can I find my way back on track? So. What is the method to use this in your life? What are the steps to use how to benefit you? Now, the thing is, I don't know. I wish I did, but I don't. Because, you see, I'm not a genius. I wish I was. I pretend to be for my job, but I'm not. So, so I don't know how to give you the answers to, to help you, to help you find situations that other people are dealing with and perhaps address how you can do it. Are we doing on time? 
crap. You guys, I am late for a conference call, so I gotta, I gotta bounce. It's gonna take about an hour. So why don't you guys go for a walk? Get a cup of coffee. And we can meet here in an hour to see if this is even possible. Who knows? Anyway, have a nice walk.